Good day, folks. This scriptural study is called Let No Man Therefore Judge You. Uh, for best value in watching this video, I would suggest speed it up and then stop it if you have any questions on any of the slides and go research it out yourself because never put your trust in me. So let's get going. Man, this is syncretism. It's man-made religious beliefs mixed in with Elohim's given revelation from the scriptures, blending these views and practices. So if we read to the left there, it says religious syncretism is the blending of the doctrines and practices of two or more religions in order to come up with something new. I did a, a video on this uh, called syncretism. I got the link right here. I'll put this uh, video at the end of this video where you can just simply click on it and watch it uh, there. And I got this information from uh, thinkingonscriptures.com. So syncretism is just basically blending the views and practices of man's religious beliefs and then the, uh, the ones that are given us uh, from the Heavenly Father above. So if we look at the etymology of syncretism, we get in theology or in philosophy, attempted reconciliation of different beliefs, parties, etc. Okay. This is from sin, which means together, S-Y-N, plus a verb of uncertain origin. So the rest of it was from uncertain. So one theory connects it to uh, kritismos, which is lying, or, and from kritizine, to lie like a Cretan. So we've heard that name before, Cretan. Together, this, would, this word syncretism would be together to lie like a Cretan if you went with this theory right here. Where we have Cretan, we have in Titus 1 verses 12, is in verse 12, but tw I put 12 and 13 together and we're reading this from the English Standard Version. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars. One of their own said that. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Paul's letter to the Colossians points to the existence of an early Christian community. The town was known for its fusion, its fusion of religious influences, syncretism, which included Jewish, Gnostic, and pagan influences that in the first century AD were described as an angel cult. So this wasn't Christianity blended here, this synchronism that we're getting from. This is in Paul's letters to the Colossians, he's warning them about these this syncretism which included the Jewish sect, which was basically tried to perform the fleshly laws and didn't accept the spiritual uh, laws that the, uh, that the Messiah brought for them to do. And then you have the Gnostics there too, and then pagan influences uh, there in the first century. And they were, again, they were described as an angel cuts cult. So we get this, we look at Colossians 2.18, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility. In a voluntary humility. That's when we get into the word, that's a voluntary humility. So don't let them beguile you in your reward in a voluntary. It is a reward once you do that. And worshiping of angels. So there's where the connection to the angel cult. Worship of angels intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So that worshiping of angels, uh, if you look at the Vatican, you look at a lot of Catholic churches, you look at a lot of homes out there, a lot of homes have these two-winged um, char characters or uh, statues and such and paintings of, of these supposed angels. Um, nowhere in scripture does it uh, describe an angel of having two wings, but all the ones that you see out there is usually an angel has... Uh, two wings and such. So this is the word. It's it's continuing to this day. So Paul was warning them in the first century of this syncretism. 
And as it today, this is my warning to everybody today of the syncretism. So Christmas equals syncretism. So if you do your research on Christmas and the history of it, you will see that it's absolutely syncretism all in all. There's no doubt about it. In Colossians 2.8, Paul uh, wrote uh, here, and again, this is English Standard Version, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. Empty deceit, that means they have no reason to be believing that way. It's just empty deceit according to human tradition. So again, Christmas is a human tradition, syncretism, according to the elemental spirits of the world. So what, what do they say about Christmas? Uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the, the spirit of the season, or they also say Jesus is the reason for the season, this elemental spirits of the world. So, um, that name Jesus, which you trace it back, goes back to the original Hebrew name of Yahushua, um, Hamashiach, which is basically the the uh, the anointed one, the word of Yahuwah. But anyway, it's the elemental spirits of the world, not according. It's not according to Yahushua, or I'm sorry, the Mashiach. So these spirits of the world are demonic spirits. They're not from the uh, spirit uh, that we gain from the Father above. So the scriptural verse we're going to look in today is Colossians 2.16. Again, it's the English Standard Version. I'm going to read it right quick. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. So this one pass judgment, if you look that up in the Strong's, that ju judgment basically means make a diagnosis. So... If you were going, to, if you had a car giving you trouble, would you take it to a um, grocery store to get a diagnosis on what's wrong with it, or would you take it to a pharmacy, to their drive-through window, and try to get a diagnosis of why your car or your truck is not running properly? No, you wouldn't, because those folks are not trained. They're not. They're not knowledgeable in your vehicle so where you would take that vehicle to uh, to get a diagnosis done would be to a a qualified uh, auto mechanic that has been trained and, and studied in the um, automotive industry for you know it doesn't have to be many years but but for the most part they have to have some knowledge and they uh, have to have some experience in the uh, uh, the workings of a automobile and such. So that's where you would take it. So just like let no one pa pass judgment on you um, here. It, it don't don't let somebody that doesn't have knowledge diagnose how you're spiritually worshiping the Father. Well, you're worshiping the Father, the Heavenly Father, in truth and the Spirit. So that's spiritually you worship Him in that way. So don't let someone that don't have knowledge in that area to, to pass judgment. This is what this judgment means. Uh, I'm not going to cover it uh, here as far as giving you a slide, but go look it up for yourself, and you're going to see it's it's going to connect it etymologically. Uh, judge is going to look up judge etymology, and you're going to see it's uh, make a diagnosis is what the uh, first rendering is. I believe it was a... Um, 12th century, which makes you put you back to the 1200 or the 1100s AD. So the words we're going to look at is food, drink, festival, new moon, and a Sabbath. And uh, here recently, I've seen so many pastors out there that have a following that they are totally, totally misdiagnosing what this scripture is saying. So I'm going to prove today through doing some research in his word which his word is the truth, and we're not going to rely on a man. So, uh, you know, um, you know, as it says, I think uh, uh, Elohim is true and every man a liar. So we don't have, we don't need to put our trust in a man, especially a pastor, um, unless that pastor has done a deeper research into what these things say.
Now that word for food is Greek Strong's number 1035. Uh, Brucis, I believe that is. Brucis. Uh, abstractly, it comes from a base of 977. Sometimes I don't supply the base just based on it doesn't give any more information. It's connected. That base is connecting to eating and food. So that's why I didn't do any more, um, you know, offering there. But there's 11 times that happens. But it means eating literally or figuratively. Keep that in mind. It's either literally or figuratively. And a lot of times it's going to be the context of the verse. You're going to figure out whether it's literal or figurative. And we'll try to cover that in this study. And then food also literally or figuratively. Now let's look at look, let's look at the etymology here. We got eat is a verb. And I'm just going to look at the highlighted consume food, devour, and consume. So isn't the word of Yahuwah? food spiritual food you know if we study it and and break it down and and uh, be like a barian and and research the scriptures daily to see if these things are true we devour it we consume it at that time so that's the food it's the word of yahuwah that we're supposed to be eating food in the noun we look at here in the highlight it's food nourishment fuel fuel also figurative so there you go so it's spiritual. It can be a figure of spiritual food, which is nourishment to our body, and it's fuel to our body. As we continue in and eat the spiritual food of the Word of Yahuwah, we get fueled and for a desire. We're able to go further and just continue to grow in His Word uh, with the fuel that that gives us. So, anyway, uh, we we always need to look for the spiritual nature, nature of the worship. And that's where everything uh, has gotten lost. And these pastors out there uh, that look back at Torah, they're looking back at Torah as a literal commandment as far as you do these things in the flesh. And it was never about doing them in the flesh. It was always about spiritual worship and such. And I've done several videos to try to um, break that over for y'all. Um, and there's, you can even go deeper than even I do in these studies. I, I only, I probably only touch the, the, uh, just below the surface or a little deeper, uh, but there's probably so much deeper that we could go here. So that spiritual food of the word of Yahuwah is where we're supposed to get fuel, our fuel. Give me fuel, give me fire. That's the, the song I thought of just then. All right, we got John 4.32 in the uh, English Standard Version. But he said to them, and this is the Messiah talking, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Okay, so he's talking about he had a box of crackers hidden away or did he have some uh, uh, beef jerky hidden away somewhere or some nuts and berries um, hidden away? No, that's not the food he was talking about. He's talking about spiritual food that, that he was able to bring in. John 6.27 Again, this is Messiah speaking. Do not work for the food that perishes. Now that's that's literal food. So if you take you take any type of food out there and uh, you just let it sit, it's gonna finally perish. It's gonna it's gonna go rotten and such. Uh, especially um, the flesh of uh, uh, the meat of uh, animals. As soon as you kill that animal, it starts decaying immediately. So there's no there's no cleanness to it. Once that animal's dead, it starts decaying. Just like we do, when, as soon as we die, we start decaying immediately. So there's no more life in our body. So it, it begins into de decay. So this here he's speaking, he's using this, the, the, the literal meaning of food here. And then he says, but for the food that endures to eternal life, so that's spiritual food, guys. There's no literal food on this earth that's going to endure to, to eternal life. It's the spiritual food, which the Son of Man, which is the Messiah, the Word of Yahuwah, will give to you. For on him, Elohim, the Father, has set his seal. So the Father sealed the Word of you, his Son, which is his Word, to come down on earth, and he set his seal on him. John 6:55, 55, 
For my flesh, again, Messiah talking, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. So is that literal food? No, it's spiritual food. We, we, you know, the Messiah has already, um, his, he's back to the Father. He's been resurrected. He's not here in the flesh anymore. So he would, you would never literally eat the flesh of a human being. And that's what he was back in the uh, first century AD. He was in the flesh. But he's talking about spiritual food here. And my blood is true drink. So we'll get to that drink here in a little bit. And one more thing, I just, this was fascinating to me. We got Greek strong, the, again, the Greek strong number 1035 uh, uh, brucis, which is food. Look what other words connected to food. It's the same Greek strong's number. Matthew 6, verses 19 and 20. This is in the English Standard Version. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. So food, the food here on earth is not the food that gives life. Yes, it gives us nourishment as far as the literal food, but he's also, this could be symbolic of man's food. Man's food destroys where thieves break in and steal. So I believe this is what this rust is here. That's what it's speaking of. And I found it fascinating that rust and food were connected together. Verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So this is the waters from above. This is where we're supposed to be drinking from, from the uh, the clean waters from the above where the Father is. That every good gift comes down from the Father above. And, and who is his? Who did he send down here to us? Is the word of himself. So where neither moth nor rust destroys or where thieves do not break in and steal. So if you get into the spiritual food of the word, it, no, nobody can destroy that. Nothing on earth can destroy that. There's no thieves that can break in and steal it. Once you eat on that spiritual uh, food, there's no way it's going to go away. It's going to be with you forever. So if we look at rust etymologically, in the highlight here, it says in late Old English, also figurative. Anything tending to spiritual corrosion and moral canker. So what can cause any spiritual corrosion? The words that people speak to you. You know, words, words do harm people. You know, there's old saying, you know, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt, you know, harm me. But words do ha harm a lot of people. But it's because they don't have a spiritual connection with the word of Yahuwah. They haven't, they haven't been studied where they can do a diagnosis on what's righteous and what's not. So uh, that's what that rust leads to. A moral, look at this, a moral canker. You know, canker sores. It's it's a canker sore on your morality, and so so. I just find these studies fascinating. I learn so much by doing them. So I um, I suggest you try to do this method, and it it brings so much to me by doing this type of method in my study. So I suggest you do the same. All right. So we look at drink, and it's Greek Strong's number forty two thirteen. Uh, Posis. Looks like uh, from the alternate of a G40, uh, Greek Strong's number 4095. We'll look at that here in a bit because that gives us a little bit of more information. A drinking, the act, that is concretely a drought. It's only used three times in scripture uh, in the Greek. So the reason I want to look at 4095 because it was close to the uh, same here. But it means to imbibe literally or figuratively. Literally or figuratively. So again, we we got to look at whether it's literal or figuratively by the context of the verse and such. cross reference it with other places and such uh, to get the gist of what he's uh, trying to tell us. But to imbibe, we're going to look at that in etymology. But it gives us 75 occurrences. So uh, a lot of the verses I'm going to share after we look at the etymology, it's going to come from this Greek Strong's number 4095 here. All right, so we look at drink, 
uh, it's a verb figurative, figurative meaning, take in through the senses. And then it comes over here, again, it says see and vibe. And so we saw that for uh, Greek Strong's number 4095. So that now we look at imbibe. <coughs> Excuse me. And we saw what this meant back. Uh, I saw what it meant about two or three years ago or four years ago, what imbibe meant. So you can take like a seed and you're um, going you to plant it in the garden to get it uh, ready to plant in the garden. A lot of people will set it in water and let it soak. And that water will, what they call imbibe, soak into the seed and help it uh, be ready uh, once it goes in the soil to get the nourishment from the soil. It will grow a lot faster then. So that's what imbibe means. So we can look at that in the figurative sense of we imbibe the, the water from the word of Yahuwah ourselves. So if we sit there and soak in it in a daily basis, it's going to help us grow and be able to diagnose and judge what the scriptures are trying to tell us. So imbibe, figurative sense of mentally drink in. There you go. Mentally drink in knowledge, ideals, etc. So that word draught, it's an act of pulling or drawing quantity of liquid that one drinks at a time. So anytime we're studying scripture, we're drawing from, we're, we're doing a draught. We're, we're act of pulling or drawing water out of the, the word of Yahuwah. And we pull so much every time we go to drink. So some people drink just for a few minutes a day and others drink for, a, you know, maybe even an hour or two hours or several hours each day. And uh, I'm not at the level where I can do it for hours a day uh, because I still have to um, regrettably uh, <laughs> um, go out and work on a regular basis. But um, I do constantly... Um, try to meditate on his word throughout the day and such and speak on it to other people. So that's what drink, imbibe, and drought means. So I think that gives some more uh, information of what that food and drink was speaking of in Colossians 2 and 16 and not a literal food and drink. John 14, 13 and 14 here, this is where, uh, this is where Yahushua was at the well of the in Palestine and that woman was sitting there and he says to her everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again so he's think he's talking literally about that well water and I think it's one of the wells of Jacob which was a man that had dug that that water after you drink of that you'll be thirsty again but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again so this is a symbolic a spiritual drink uh, that he's talking about, and it's he's talking about uh, soaking up the word of Yahuwah or drinking from the word of Yahuwah, which is his blood. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So again, we drink from the waters above, and that's from the Father. Every great gift comes down from the Father above. I believe that's James 2.17. So he was a gift to us. John 7, 37, uh, on the last day of the feast, the great day, and we're going to cover feast too, the great day, um, the great day, Yahushua, which that was uh, the uh, final of the booths that, that shows that the Messiah kept booths while he was on earth. Uh, he stood up and cried out, if anyone thirst, let him drink, come to me and drink. So again, he's not talking about literally drinking from him. He's he, he probably he's not offering you. You don't have a jug of water there, and he's you know he's pouring you out a glass of water uh, to drink from. He's talking about the word um, from the Father above, the word of Yahuwah that he spoke. All right, Greek Strong's number eighteen fifty nine. We got festival. Okay, so we're gonna look at festival. It's a uh, a orte is the word it looks like, um, a festival, feast, holy day. So we're going to look at each one of these words. There's 27 times in the uh, in the uh, Renewed Testament or the Renewed Covenant where a festival, feast, or holy day is used. So that's quite a few times for festivals we're no longer supposed to keep. Okay, the three words uh, from the previous uh, Greek Strong's number was festival, feast, and uh, holiday. So, uh, 
and actually it was Holy Day, but when I looked up Holy Day, um, um, etymology brought up Holy Day. So that's how ho ho uh, Holy Day uh, turned into holiday. Uh, festival, uh, it's a festival day, appointed day of festive celebration. And it's true, anybody that's kept the um, feast of uh, Leviticus 23, um, it is an appointed day. Uh, we can find all them appointments. Uh, if you uh, learn scripture, you can find exactly when those appointed days are and when we're supposed to celebrate those. Uh, feast, we look at it, it says secular celebration with feasting and entertainment often held on a church uh, holiday. So that's true, the church being the assembly of Yahuwah, which is the body of Messiah, and uh, anything outside of that is the harlot daughters of the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church. Um, so the the feast of Leviticus 23 are definitely stepping out of Babylon and, uh, and, and stepping into uh, gaining the mark of the Father above. Uh, where he knows who you are by keeping uh, his feast. But it's a secular celebration with feasting and entertainment. So anybody has ever participated, the feasting is not only literal as far as, yeah, we usually have some pretty good meals on them days, but we also have spiritual food that is offered up uh, because usually we get together in a group and um, we're able to uh, share with one another and each and everybody brings their own gift and shares that gift with one another and it just helps build up so if we look at ourselves being symbolically a, a branches and we look at that last festival of boost when we build the boost we go out and get branches well that's talking about people the character traits of people so each one of those branches from them trees have different character traits about them and so we can feast and gain from each and every person because i have people that i study with that they have gifts that i have no i i I'm not as gifted in. Uh, even my wife Tanya, she 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 digs into the ancient pictograph letters, and she breaks down each and every word, um, and she does, it, and she writes it out. And that's that's not my gift, but she's very gifted in it. So I always defer to her when I need to ask a question about the ancient Hebrew uh, pictograph. Um, I defer to her because she's so much more studied in it than I am. And she, she, she gains so much more enjoyment out of it and such. So it is entertaining when, when you really get into the word and you start digging deeper and you get, you get past that surface, uh, point of the black and white and you dig a little bit deeper and you get to the Strong's numbers and then you dig a little bit deeper and get to the root of the word. And then you take, take it from there and go to the history of etymology, which basically that's going to take you back to what these words meant uh, when they initially translated them uh, from the uh, Hebrew and Greek over into the Old English. And that's where you can find it in etymology um, when people like John Wycliffe were doing what he was doing. Uh, that's why etymology is so important because you can go back and see what that word John Wycliffe had translated or even... Um, William Tyndale and guys like that, William Tyn uh, Tyndale lost his life just for doing what he did. The Catholic Church uh, set him up and um, strangled him and burned him at the stake for what he did and such. So, um, but but these feasts are uh, festivals. They are enjoyment. Uh, they're entertainment because our entertainment is getting to know the Father above more. That's our relate. That's that's where we want to take our relationship. So we look, I put Holy Day in, we got Holiday, so we look at it here, here we go, we got Holy Day, that's how they were connected, a consecrated day, yeah, and if you go, you do enough, you diagnose the word of Yahuwah enough, and, and, and learn from it, and get skilled in it, you'll know that uh, each one of those um, feasts or festivals are consecrated, they're set apart. You know, uh, you're supposed to do things different on them. It says here, religious anniversary. So, uh, yeah, uh, they are religious anniversaries. Also, the Sabbath is a feast. Uh, so uh, to get that, if you, you want to know that Sabbath is a feast, what do we do on the Sabbath? We eat from the word. We drink from the waters above. We eat the flesh and, the and drink the blood of the word of Yahuwah, which was our um, Messiah that came here in the flesh. So that's our Sabbath. Go to Leviticus 23, 2, and it says these are the feast of Yahuwah. And the first one that's mentioned is Sabbath. So, and how do we find that Sabbath? 
Well, you don't depend on man and his seven-day count. You depend on the sun, moon, and stars, which are mentioned in Genesis 14 through 16. That's the only way you can uh, diagnose when your Sabbaths are, is through that way, because you can't go by the traditions of man, because you always defer back to Scripture first. Scripture's always number one. So anything for man is secondary to that as far as a witness uh, for truth. All right, so the scriptures that feast is used in, we got John 7, 8, and this is the Messiah talking, and this is King Jimmy version. Go ye up into the feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. So there again, the Messiah is talking about they're keeping a feast, and he's going to go up and keep the feast. He just, he said he wasn't going to go up just yet. Uh, we got John 2, 23 in the English Standard Version. Now, when he was in Jerusalem, at the Passover, and by the way, I, I just want to let y'all know, be careful using the English Standard Version because um, it doesn't always co, um, it's just easier to read than a King Jimmy, but it leaves out some things there, so you miss the context of the verse, so always take the King Jimmy, always go to your strong numbers, go to the roots too, if they, um, if they're able to add to what uh, you're already researching in, and then go to your etymology. That's my standard right there. Now, I look at context. I look at, um, you know, um, the uh, other scriptures that are uh, uh, have the kind of the same talk in them. I'm trying to think of the word, and I'm not thinking of it right now. But, um, but anyway, just be careful when you're reading because all these versions, again, it's because they've been translated. Uh, we got to be real careful, but uh, but we got to go back to the Strong's and we got to go back to etymology to help confirm what these verses are saying in the black and white or in the red. You know, here is Messiah is written in the red in the King James Version. Uh, John two twenty three. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, so this is talking about Yahushua, the Messiah. Many believed in his name. They believed in his authority. They believed in his character. They believed in his honor when they saw the signs that he was doing. Acts 18, 21, King Jimmy again. But bade them farewell. This is, this is talking about Paul. Paul bade them farewell saying, I must by all means keep this feast. By all means, he must keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. <coughs> Excuse me. But I will return again unto you, if Elohim will. And he sailed from Ephesus. So this is Paul speaking. Now we just have John 22, 23, where it's talking about um, the Messiah being in Jerusalem at the Passover feast. Okay. And then if all those feasts were done away with, okay, though we're not supposed to keep, why is Paul still keeping them? You know, a lot of people say, well, he's a false apostle. Well, you're mistaken, guys. If you think he's a false apostle, then you're very much mistaken because most people that think Paul's a false apostle do, do not realize that the, the Torah was originally meant to be lit, uh, figurative language. It was a figurative language of how we're supposed to worship in the spirit and not in a fleshly way, a literal way of killing actual animals. And again, I've shared videos on that too, proving that these animals are character traits of people and such. So it's just going deeper. We've got to dig deeper and to go as deep as we can uh, to find the truth. But again, Paul's keeping the those same feast that the Messiah kept. Messiah fulfilled and kept all of them. And Paul continued on. He said, imitate me as I imitate the Messiah. So he continued on. Here we got Luke 2, 41 and 42. This is when the Messiah was 12 years old. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. That custom is just, it's, you do it every year. That's that's if you look at Leviticus 23 several times, it will say this is a everlasting um, festival for you. 
So it's a custom when things, you do it every year, year after year after year, it's a custom. Just like man has made Christmas a custom and they made it a custom out of syncretism with the um, with Saturnalia. It's their custom. So people of the world, their custom is Christmas. And and the next festival coming up is their their New Year's Day. And there's so much um, paganism in that um, that they made that a custom too. But our custom. And the people that walk with the word of Yahuwah, our custom is to keep those festivals of Leviticus 23. Uh, John 4, 45, this is a English Standard Version. So when he came to Galilee, again, this is talking about the Messiah. The Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. There again, he was at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So they were imitating the Messiah too. They were going to the feast just like he did. All right, we'll carry on here. We're going to look at uh, that Passover, unleavened bread, and uh, Pentecost, which in the Hebrew it's called the Shabbat, and you actually it's an actual count uh, to the Shabbat. And um, and I've offered a couple uh, videos here, one on the Passover lamb. You know, look up lamb etymology. You're not going to find a uh, an image like this in etymology in your head. It's going to be something that you're not expecting. It's not a four-legged beast with wool and it goes by. And uh, see nights you shall count. This is where all the Sunday worshipers have made a mistake. They don't know what a sea night means. But we can also use that sea night uh, to count to Shabbat or Pentecost. So we we'll look at these scriptures here. Matthew 26, 18 in the English Standard Version. And this is Messiah talking. He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So this is this is the last part before they arrested um, the Messiah later that night after the Passover. Um, anyway, he kept the Passover then. He kept the Passover, and if you do your research, you'll find out the Passover, the custom is you keep it on the uh, 14th day of the first month, which is a babe, um, and you keep it at evening. So when evening begins, that's when your Passover begins, okay? So that's the Passover is what happened back in Egypt when they were first introduced to the word of Yahuwah through uh, Moses that drew them, draws out the water that he gave them, they started eating the Passover, and that's when they started learning about the word, uh, the the word of Yahuwah, which is is our Messiah here today, that we can uh, continue to to um, be a part of. So if you if you want to get to know the Messiah and get a relationship with him, you got to get in the Word, you got to get in the Scriptures, and you got to dig deeper. So. So Passover, uh, the Messiah kept. Then Mark 14, 12, um, English Standard Version, it says, on the first day of unleavened bread. Okay, that day is actually there. There's a lot of times the day is there, and it's, uh, and it's not really supposed to be there. It wasn't in the original writings. Um, but the first day of unleavened bread, we've got to understand the day begins when the sun appears in the morning. Uh, when it uh, breaks above our apparent horizon, and it, the day ends... Um, the the following day when that sun appears from our um, well the literal day from dawn to dusk is when the sun's above our apparent horizon uh, so anyway Tanya and I worship that way and then when it the sun disappears it becomes evening and then it becomes morning and then there's the following day where the sun reappears above our apparent horizon so so anyway, on the first day of unleavened bread, which is the Passover festival, so it's a week festival from the 14th evening to the 21st evening, when they sacrifice a Passover lamb. So during that period of time, the Jews, this is why they didn't accept the Messiah, because they felt they were supposed to literally kill animals, and they still was. And they were, the ones that were following the Messiah already knew that those that Passover lamb was not a four-legged beast that the Jews were actually killing. It was actually themselves. 
uh, that they were pushing themselves out to graze on the word of Yahuwah. And that's why it was, you know, unleavened bread. You, you graze on the grain and grains make a, a bread and, uh, and there's no, no, nothing puffed up about his word. It's, that's why they call it unleavened. His disciple said to him, again, this is, this is the same, kind of the same um, area where they're talking about keeping the Passover. Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? So this is just a cross-reference. Oh, that was a word I was looking for, cross-reference verses. So this is just cross-reference verses of that same time uh, that I believe occurred in 30 AD. Um, Acts 2.1, King James Version. And when the day of Pentecost, which is Shabbat or the count to weeks or the festival of weeks, or some uh, even call it festival of harvest, uh, which is in the word of Yahuwah, was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So fully come, that means that count will have been counted fully at that time. So there's always a count to uh, Pentecost, but it actually, if you if you already know how to count, you really don't have to literally count. You are, count, you already know what day it's going to be on just based on the calendar of Yahuwah. But these two um, videos I put at the end of this video, if you want to take a look at them, and uh, find out more about the Passover lamb and what these Sinites and how they, they figure in into the true count uh, to uh, Shabbat or Pentecost. All right, now when we look at New Moon, New Moon is only one time in Scripture that it's happened, and it's actually, it happens in this Colossians 2.16 where Paul's warning them, don't. Don't let anybody diagnose whether you are right or wrong in what you are eating and drinking or pertaining to a festival or a, or a new moon day or a Sabbath. That's what he's telling them. He's he's saying they they came into this. They lived in this place of syncretism and they they came over to the word of Yahuwah and realized what the true gospel was. So they were pulling themselves out. Not unlike a lot of us that stepped away from Christmas. I stepped away from Christmas 22 years ago. Well, I had a lot of people tried to diagnose the situation then. Some said I joined a cult. Um, you know, um, Tanya had a struggle with it there for a, a little bit, you know, and I struggled with it because I was trying to be too militant about my new belief and such, and I learned a lesson, you know, don't, you can't, you can't press anybody to uh, do this. You can only speak um, patiently, patiently with them, and then over a period of time, Tanya eventually uh, came over with me, and she saw that it was, you know, and it came from somebody else. It was somebody else that she, um, blessed her in seeing the uh, truth, and I just kind of laid the seeds there, and then finally somebody uh, put some manure on it <laughs> and uh, and uh, made it grow. But uh, uh, Tanya and I today are evenly yoked. Um, we've had the pleasure of uh, being literally um, married as the world sees marriage for over 41 years. And, um, and I've been, you know, I met her over 43 years ago and I still remember that day. Uh, vividly in my mind so but anyway new moon i i get i get carried away here especially when i think about tanya and, and speak about her and such um she's she's my she's out of all the people on earth she's my number one now she's not my number one spiritually my number one is the word of Yahuwah. but anyway what we're going to do with new moon um we're going to break it down here. We're going to look at new, what new means etymologically. We're going to look at um, moon etymologically. We're going to look at month etymologically. And we're also going to look at day because as it, you see here as a noun by implication of a day. So when we, when we practice and keep the new moon, we don't keep it during uh, the time that the uh, sun is uh, not visible. We keep it as it's above our apparent horizon. So when it appears from the east, it disappears at night. Uh, the West, that's our, that's our day. So that's what we celebrate. And today is the 30th day of the uh, ninth month. And we're going to be, Yahuwah willing, 
we're going to be trying to get a video out on the 10th new moon day and some of the signs for the 10th new moon and how they compared. We're going to compare it with some previous years and see if we can find um, any more truth uh, with his celestial clock above us. But anyway, uh, again, I digress. The festival of a new moon. So um, here we go. Let's go to our etymology. We got new. It's an adjective uh, made or established for the first time which uh, we know that's not a new moon because that happens every month. Uh, fresh, now the new moon does become fresh each month. Um, if you look at it as a piece of fruit, uh, when a piece of fruit is fully grown, it's fresh to uh, be picked and, uh, and such. But here we get even better here. Recently made or grown. So recently grown. So increased in uh, growth. So grown to me just means you're at your fullest. Uh, so just like, uh, we grow in the word, you know, uh, that's to me, the symbolism of the, uh, moon can also be lacking it because it says in Genesis 1 16, it says the lesser light, uh, that rules the night. Well, if you look at the Messiah, when he came here on earth, he, he was walking amongst, uh, people of darkness and he, uh, he ruled the night. He, if you look up night, it can also mean wickedness. And he ruled over it. He never sinned and such. So he was fully grown. Uh, he had all the word in him that was spoken from the Father above. And uh, so he was in Greece. In love. So we can look at that moon as being at the full. That's when it's uh, most increased in its growth. Then if we look at moon noun here, it's heavenly body, which revolves about the earth monthly. So yeah, the, the moon. Um, the uh, surface we live on is uh, it, it does it it circuits around us um, so it comes up just kind of like the sun except right now it's more toward the uh, tropic of, of uh, cancer and the sun is further out to the tropic of capricorn uh, that's why our days are shorter but our moon's going to have a longer night because it's closer to the tropic of cancer so it'll stay up longer um through the night so it's going to come up and it's going to be uh ruling the night tonight and that's going to be visible and i uh, i i hope i get to go out and uh get some good video of it tonight uh as it's uh ruling as it starts its rule because i'm not going to stay up through the night and uh and watch the whole thing uh but i'll get up early in the morning uh before the sun appears and get a good shot of it and maybe get some star shots and stuff but but moon is that heavenly body that basically ro rotates around it revolves around us circuits around us and such when we look at month it's also a noun originally the month was interval between one new moon and the next so that's that's how it was originally guys and and that's not what it is on the roman pagan calendar the gregorian calendar that we keep today the moon does not line up with the first uh, day of the month the full moon doesn't line up for it uh with it it occasionally will just because um uh they will you know they they're not in sync with one another so um you know the catholic christianity and their harlot daughters are not in sync uh with the celestial calendar from above that was given us uh back in genesis 1 and such so anyway so when we again get studied in this we're able we're better out to do a diagnosis and judge something do you know uh, if you look up the hebrew word pray which is palal the hebrew word palal is the word for pray it means the first thing you see it says to judge so once we get studied in this we're able to judge what's right and wrong so month again it was originally the month was the interval between one new moon and the next so one from one full moon to the next full moon day if we look at day etymologically a period during which the sun is above our apparent horizon so the sun never does go below the horizon it just goes below our perspective of where our horizon is based on the angular resolution of our eyes so that's our day and when we can see the sun in the morning and when we can uh, the sun disappears in the evening or right before evening begins all right, so I wanted to look at the Hebrew because there was only one new moon, um, in uh, uh, which was in Colossians 2.16, this verse we're studying. <coughs> so the Hebrew word is uh, Hebrew Strong's number 2320, uh, Kadesh. 
and uh, it's from 2318, and I share that up here. Yeah, the, the new moon by implication a month. Look how many times it occurs in the original covenant. 279 times. So you can't tell me that he gave us instructions about the new moon 279 times. And we're, you know, all of a sudden we're supposed to stop doing that. You know, Yahuwah says he's the same uh, yesterday, today, and, and uh, tomorrow. So uh, he doesn't change. And neither does the words that he speaks the instructions that he gave us. Uh, now, there is our new covenant, but it's a different way that we get to the Father uh, than they did back in the, the day. We go through the flesh and blood of the Messiah, and then we eat of his flesh and we drink of his blood, and that's how we get to the Father. We get to know the Word, which is the Messiah, then we get to know the Father. We get to get to the Father. And that's that's what we have today. That is uh, That is the renewed covenant. Uh, that we say uh, we're still supposed to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice on a daily basis. So that is what I've studied out over the years. Now, H2320, uh, and, and talking about keeping the celestial calendar, Tanya and I, you know, not to say that uh, I've always been 100% accurate on it, but I've been studying into it for several years. That doesn't mean I'm 100% accurate till to this day. Uh, I still am, you know, I'm still open to any new ideals and uh, information from Scripture that would show me that it's a different way. But yet I have yet to have anyone be able to provide that, and I have yet to be able to find it myself. But if we look at the root word to that, again, it's spelt the same way. See the words, uh, the letters here? It's Kadesh. Uh, to be new. So we already looked at new etymology, possibly to rebuild. So instead of looking at etymology on another slide, I just wanted to real briefly just, I went up and looked up rebuild etymology. So take the time, go look it up yourself. So build up again. So if some, something falls down, like you have a house that falls down, what do you do? You, you rebuild it. And, you, and when you rebuild it completely, build it up again, it's new. It's, it's new again. So you have to build it completely. Uh, you know, your first uh, part of the foundation that you lay is, is it's not new at that time. It's not built up again. It's just, it's just the beginning. So uh, a crescent moon is not considered to be new. It would be just the beginning of heading toward new, waxing toward new. So again, the new moon in Hebrew by implication a month. And we've, again, the uh, etymology uh, helps go deeper and it gives us our answer for what that uh, new moon is and what the new moon is. Amos 8.5, and we'll see here in scripture, this is uh, the original covenant. We got Amos 8.5 to see where they practiced uh, keeping the uh, new moon as a solemn feast day saying, when will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn? That's a question mark they were asking. That was a question they were asking. And the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit. So, again, they new moon day was a shutdown period, which we will shut down tomorrow. I will not do my regular business tomorrow. I will keep new moon day as a, as a festival. Uh, Ezekiel 46 1 uh, gives us in the King Jimmy, Thus said Yahuwah, Elohim, the gate of the inner court that looks toward the east shall be shut the six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be open, and then the day of the new moon it shall be open. So once you figure out how the count, the begin your month and count from the when that new moon is, you'll understand that these six working days. There's three different days here. There's there's a Sabbath day, there's a new moon day, and then there's six working days. And that happens every month, from full moon to full moon. Isaiah 66, 23. Uh, this comes from the uh, English Standard Version. From new moon to new moon, and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares Yahuwah. So that doesn't look like that's going to stop anytime soon. It looks like it's going to continue on. Now, when we look at Sabbath, we have Greek Strong's number 4521. So Sabbath here uh, is actually, 
the Greek sabbaton, and they use it two different ways. It can actually be the seventh day Sabbath, but it can also uh, be weak. So when we look at it here, we're going to look at uh, Sabbath, plus we're going to look at this word here called sea night, which, uh, I, again, guys, I've done studies on this, and I've got C, uh, a sea night video here that's going to any pastor out there that still believes um, that the first day of the week in scripture was the first day of the week as in Sunday. Um, if they really go in this with an open attitude and uh, looking to learn and such, they're going to see uh, that the first day of the week was never, day was it never there. It was saying first of the sea night, first of the week. That's what a sea night is. So we got here the Sabbath, that is the Shabbat, which is Hebrew word for it. Hebrew origin is H7676. If you want to go look up that, there's many times Sabbath is more than 68 times in the Hebrew, but Hebrews has a lot more uh, words than the uh, Renewed Covenant does. Uh, it says also uh, our day of weekly repose from secular avocations, which that's what we do. We don't continue to do business on the day. I defer if I have any customers try to get in touch with me. Um, on that day, only as it, if it's emergency will I uh, spend the time to try to help them out. Uh, but other than that, I uh, put my phone on silent. They have a backup way, the emergency way to get in touch with me if they need to. Uh, but usually most are just saying, you know, hey, just get with me tomorrow if you can. And, and that's how it happens. So uh, me and Tanya have been very well blessed. This, this keeping this calendar the way we do has never interfered with my business in any way. In fact, to me, it's truly blessed us. Uh, we have gained so much um, from keeping it the way, not only in knowledge, but also in, in security in this uh, old evil world we live in. Uh, then we got, by extension, a C-night. That is the interval between two Sabbaths. So what is C-night? If you look it up at Amash, it's literally seven nights, guys. So the first day of the week would be the the first day or the first of the sea night. So the the first night of the it would be the first night after Sabbath. So uh, again, we're going to look at it a little bit better here on uh, etymology. So I'm already kind of covering some stuff that's in etymology on my ne my next slide but that is the interval between two sabbaths so there's seven nights that happen between the sabbath day and the next sabbath day there's seven nights exactly so the first of the week in scripture is talking about the that night that first night after the the sabbath So look up Sabbath etymologically. Uh, we got here seventh day of the week in the Jewish calendar. Then of course they go a little crazy here. They put Saturday. Um, you know that that's been some dirtying up from um, the evils of this world. Uh, you know, especially the Jesuits that have controlled a lot of the teachings out there that these pastors are teaching today. It's 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 a false gospel. Uh, that goes back to the second beast, which are the Jesuits today. And they use their magic to twist everything to where you think you're doing good, uh, but it's truly evil. They, you know, they see evil as good and good as evil. So that's, that's how they twist it. It's, it's the, they're, they're trees of good and evil. Each one of them, the Catholic church is a tree of good and evil. And, and, uh, and these pastors out there at these, uh, these churches, uh, that just basically are the harlot daughters. They're they're um, basically teaching a false gospel because they've been deceived by the Jesuit magic out there. Just like the Jesuit magic has covered up the true shape of the earth, and they've uh, done everything in the world to try to detach you away from the heavenly Father above by talking to you about this big bang and evolution and we came from pond scum and gained legs and turned into monkeys and then eventually converted over to humans. Uh, but yet, you know, and that all came from nothing, but yet we have all these emotions in our body, especially love. And then we look at our eyeballs and see how advanced our eyeballs is. Uh, there's, there's none of them. There's no man today that can build an eyeball that can do what we can do. They can not build a human being that their bodies can do what our bodies can do. They're, they're inferior. And, um, so this is a spiritual walk. 
but this seven day of the week in Jewish calendar, again, uh, seven day of the week goes back to the Israelite calendar. Now, all Jews are Israelites, but not all Israelites are Jews. And if you look up Jewish, it, uh, uh, a Yahudim or a Jew means to be praised by Yahuwah. So the ones that were destroyed in 70 AD, they were not praised by Yahuwah. Those Jews lost their nation. They lost their temple. They lost their city. Uh, Roman Rome took over in 70 AD. It was all said and done then. That Jewish kingdom uh, doesn't exist to this day. Uh, that one over there now is, is the fake one. It's not a true one. And uh, there's there's plenty of information on that. Plenty of studies go out there. But, uh, but again, we get back to Sabbath. I digress. I get off track here. As observed by the Jews as a day of rest for secular employment and religious aver uh, observance. Well, if you're a true spiritual Jew you and pray, you're spiritually praised by Yahuwah, then yeah, you are a Yahudim, and you do uh, we do keep this day of rest from secular. But as far as being a physical Jew, it's not being it's not about being a fleshly uh, Jew. It's about being a spiritual Jew. Now we look at Sinai in the etymology. It says period or space of seven days and nights a week. So again, they add this days in, but I'm going to show y'all here that days. Days was added in later. This is actually talking about that's that's why I got the name C night. If it was supposed to have, um, it it would be C day, you know, seven days. But it says C night, so it's a night. It's talking about seven nights, not uh, not. So that's it. Where it again? It says literally seven nights. Here's one of the slides I did in my C night video, my first one. Again, I just want to go through here and highlight literally seven nights. This is from uh, one of the sources here. The other source I looked at here, it's got seven nights here. Uh, we got another source here, a period of seven nights, seven nights. Another source here, seven nights. Uh, then you got the uh, old English original spelling here, but it's got in parentheses seven nights here, seven nights. So again, it's about seven nights. The week in uh, the Greek, the Sabbaton, when it's uh, it's uh, rendered as a week, is talking about seven nights. It's the nights between the Sabbaths. So there's seven nights between the Sabbaths. To help explain that a little bit better, so um, tomorrow will be noon moon day. So this is day in the yellow, yellow like the sun. You know, the sun appears kind of yellow, and uh, and then this will be the first sea night. At the end of New Moon Day, then the second C night, third C night, fourth C night, fifth C night, sixth C night, seventh, and this is the night that happens right before the first Sabbath of the tenth month. So if we go to where, um, let's take this, let's make this um, the uh, Passover when the Messiah was uh, crucified. Now most. Most think he was crucified on the first month, but if you do your real deeper study, you'll find that he was crucified on the second month, which there's a second Passover. And it's almost like a, uh, a pass-go type. If you miss the first one for some reason or another uh, through a long journey or being unclean, you you got to keep it in the second month. So this is a, a do-over for people here. So if he got taken in the night and before he appeared you know they wouldn't have taken a man and appeared before uh, the uh, governor or pilot you know during that period of time uh, because it was their sabbath so they you got to remember these are pharisaical jews and such so if we look at this as a second passover when he actually died during this period of time during the daytime and then this, the uh, second Passover began, you got, uh, well, let's just count the days. He said, I'll be resurrected on the uh, third day. So this is the first day he died. This is the second day. And this is the third day, which is the 16th day of the second month. And if we look at the first night of that, or the first of the seven nights, this is it right here. So when Mary and Peter and them, while it was still dark, they appeared to him, it was still nighttime. It had yet to become day. So if we read in Matthew 28, 1, we can get the gist of that. And then we're going to get into Mark 16. And Mark 16, 9, it will give us a little bit more. But these are basically cross-references, Matthew and Mark are. 
After then, in this, in the end of the Sabbath, in uh, in those brackets, uh, that word is not there. It said, after then, Sabbath, as it began to grow light to first of week. So first of the seven nights. So it began to grow light. Well, if, we, if we're in complete darkness through the night and then we know if anybody's been out there before it start, you start seeing the light uh, of the horizon in the east, you always see the light before you ever see the sun, which when, is when the day begins. But it says begin to grow light. So that's early part of that time period where you could see the light of the sun, but it was still darkness, dark enough where you could probably not read anything. Uh, it would be that uh, type of darkness or you couldn't really do any work. But this is talking about uh, the first night or the first of the seven nights okay first of the seven nights and it came Mary, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre which is the tomb uh, Mark 16 1 and 2 and when the Sabbath was passed Mary Magdalene and Mary which is the it says here it says the mother but it's bracketed uh, of James it just says the Mary of James and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, okay, which morning is that period of time between the light from the sun and then the physical sun. So very early would be right at that period where you could still not see any light. So it's it's beginning to grow light. So it'd be very early in the morning because the night is split up by evening uh, at night and then morning so if you look at genesis 1 all the days begin with the day yahuwah does his work and then it becomes evening and becomes our morning so that <coughs> means between that evening and morning there was night so that's another jewish tradition and even some uh, hebrew roots tradition that is mistaken on what a, how the uh, beginning of a day when it begins i'm gonna take a sip of my tea right quick And it says, they came until the sepulcher at the rising of the sunlight. So it wasn't rising of the sun. It was rising of the sun's light. So again, um, I won't get into the, the, uh, the physics of it. But anyway, the light from the sun was appearing already. They just, the sun hadn't appeared yet. And we look here in Mark 16, 9, which happens seven verses later than here. It says, now when Yahushua was risen early, first of the seven nights, he was risen early, first of the seven nights, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Well, when people say, well, he didn't rise on the third day. Well, look what risen means. It's Greek Strong's number 44. 450 means to stand up so how did he come out of the tomb he had to physically get up off of that area where they laid him stand up which he stood up and that was him risen he had yet to go to the father because if you do your due diligence you'll see where he told mary don't don't hold on to him because he had yet to rise to the father and such so um so anyway Everything falls into play. Nothing contradicts itself. If you really get into the deeper research, I mean, it just really opens up the word of Yahuwah for you. It's just a blessing for what happens when that, when you see it. All right, so uh, now we look at Sabbath used in the uh, Renewed Covenant, the uh, New Testament. Uh, Luke 13, 10, English Standard Version. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. This was the Messiah. What's he doing He's teaching on the Sabbath? Because he was fulfilling the law. And if we imitate Paul, like Paul did the Sabbath, and we and, uh, as the Messiah, then we've got to be keeping the Sabbath ourselves. Colossians 23, 56. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments on the Sabbath. They rested according to the commandment. Okay? So again, this is them after the uh, Messiah's death so if Messiah if that was hung on the cross as people say that was all that was nailed to the cross no it wasn't because then why was his disciples 
on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. Why were they still keeping that Sabbath commandment? Come on, guys. Come out of Babylon. Come out of those harlot churches and those uh, teachers that are teaching you good and evil. I'm not saying they teach you complete evil. They teach you some good things, but there's there's much evil that comes out of their mouths. And, uh, and it's only because they've been deceived uh, by by the adversary that that same adversary that's been from the beginning so we've got to be careful of how we look at scripture and stuff and um, i know if you ever change and you start walking away out of babylon it's going to put a hardship on you and such like it did me uh, my family very few of my 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 physical uh blood uh true blood I shouldn't say true blood because I, I I could say my true blood family is my spiritual family because they eat from the same they drink from the same blood I drink from so they are my family we we do have a kinship with the word of Yahuwah. Um so I should say my maternal siblings and such so you know, before Tanya and I walked away and we were still keeping these things. I mean, we were very active in family gatherings and such like that. But now, you know, it's like they don't even want to, they don't even want to be around with it, around us now because it's kind of like we scare them, you know. It's like we got cooties or something. So uh, it does place a hardship. I got to admit, the first few weeks of me coming out, and Tanya not completely accepting it, and uh, and people were in her ear too uh, that shouldn't have been because again they were given a false diagnosis because they didn't know the first thing they were talking about. They just had a preconceived notion of what they thought it was. Most people have um, they have an opinion on scripture and don't know the first thing about what scriptures is saying, and that's that's true for most. So again, I digress. Uh, Acts fifteen twenty one. Um, this is a. I think it's Paul teaching here. It says, "For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues." So what are they doing? Still keeping every Sabbath, you know? It's because it's still it's still. Uh, pertinent today still we, the only way to have a relationship with them is that's our sign between him and him go go look up exodus 31 13 through 17 or we go read ezekiel 20 12 through uh verse 20 and see that what that sign is acts 18 4 that sign is also a mark just think of that it's a mark um Acts 18.4, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So this was Paul. Paul was preaching to the Jews and the Greeks, but he did it on the Sabbath. That's when he did it. I'm sure there's days in between that he spoke to them outside of that, uh, that time, but particularly on the Sabbath, that's when he did that. Acts 13, 42 to 44, as they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas. So even the ones that were high in the uh, fleshly Judaic law, they, uh, they converted. They were devout converts that followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the favor of Elohim. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of Yahuwah. So the next Sabbath, so what's Paul, you know, again, Acts is written by Luke. What, what if Paul is a false disciple, what in the heck is Luke putting him inside of inspired scripture for? It's because people, they don't understand. They, they don't, they don't, you know, even Peter says Paul's hard to understand. And I can, I can admit to myself, I've only started getting an inkling of what Paul um, writes now because I learned what the spiritual nature of what the Torah is and what how people get that confused and such. So, guys, Colossians 2.16. So many pastors have taught you so wrong 
they think this food and drink is those uh, those animal that Torah law and uh, I think it's a Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy maybe 14 possibly where it talks about these beasts or these animals that you you can eat from and the other ones that you no, don't eat from those animals are character traits of people so it never was it was never about talking about what you were actually eating and drinking it was to always talking about your spiritual food and your spiritual drink which is the flesh and blood of the of the messiah it's the water from above okay that's where the messiah came from he came from the he's the word of yahuwah he came down to us and lived in the flesh on this earth he put it he sacrificed himself in the flesh to to be the first fruit for many in the way he died to this world and died a physical death and then became uh gained life and 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 he's eternal the word is eternal so these festivals new moons are a sabbath so with all this said i have proven that these pastors are false teaching a false gospel we are supposed to still eat the spiritual food and drink and regrettably they're not my last video with that flat earth video of that debate uh, both them ministers uh, one has more knowledge than the other one but they they still falls way short of getting a grip on the truth and it's only because he's probably uh, been indoctrinated and been taught in a certain way and he thinks he's right because he got training in a certain way and he got brought up by a certain pastor and that's the way all of us are if we you know if we're brought up to believe in lies you know it's like our parents lied to us about uh, Santa Claus you know and I perpetrated that lie to my own children you know and my children believed it they believed it so what are we supposed what does John call uh, the Messiah's uh, people he calls them little children so we should we should always consider ourselves little children so don't always believe everything someone tells you take it always to the word so we're supposed to drink the spiritual food and drink we're supposed to keep those festivals we're supposed to shut down and not do any regular business during that time same way on the new moon day and same way on the fest uh, on the sabbath um so I suppose many of you might get benefit out of this video uh, if you do again give me a thumbs up uh, if you would like to share it please do um, hit the share button and then also uh, subscribe if you haven't already subscribed uh, so let no one no man let no one man therefore do a diagnosis for you of what those scriptures say let no man therefore do a diagnosis for you don't even i'm a man don't trust me go dig deeper guys if you don't know how to study scripture reach out to me um you can reach out through me uh, to me through this uh youtube channel you can also uh reach out to me uh most people have my email address and some even have my phone number if you have my email if, if I, you're on my email list and you have my phone number at the very end of all my emails you have my phone number reach out to me by text or voice I'll be glad to we can do a zoom meeting together I'd be glad to uh, I've got a great study buddy that's uh, lives a quarter of a mile away from me and um, and we can get on there together we can get you have some other people you like to bring on and we'll show you our you know how we uh, we do our study and research and such so just don't let any man judge you when you make a decision uh, once you see scripture for the truth and you step out of that world and you start coming out of Babylon don't let anybody judge you because they're not going to make the proper diagnosis because they're they haven't seen what you've seen so nobody can if they've never been to the training through it and in the training is just how you get started is just get into scriptures and start learning how to study go to the the lexicons and if you don't have a electronics they've got a lexicon books that you can get and go through the lexicon it takes a lot longer to find the words that way but 
you can do it. Even etymology. There's etymology uh, dictionaries out there that you can get your hands on. So, um, everybody have a great day. Um, again, I'm, I plan on trying to get a uh, new moon video out. A uh, little bit of a, a comparison from the last few years and where the stars are with uh, where the moon, the full moon is tonight. And uh, we'll try to get that done. And as always, I uh, forgot to do it in the last video, but I always give praise to the Father above. And I say it in the Hebrew term, hallelujah, which means praise to Yah, which Yah in my uh, studies has taught me that that's the teachings of truth or the teachings of revelation or the teacher of truth or revelation or the instructions or the law, if you want to say law. But anyway. Uh, that's what hallelujah means to me. So hallelujah, hallelujah indeed.